troubles coming down the road, you can be sure nine will run into the ditch before they reach you. President Calvin Coolidge. Nine may have passed them by, but at the end of the Roaring Twenties, the tenth hit Americans right between the eyes. The 1929 stock market crash brought prosperity to a sudden halt. Banks failed, businesses collapsed, and the United States entered the worst economic crisis in its history. By 1932, one quarter of the nation's workforce was out of work. People stood on bread lines and slept in parks, rode cattle cars and huddled in railroad yards, lived in tin shacks or junked cars. Children scoured city dumps for food. I remember seeing a few people on the corner selling papers, uh, three cents and five cents. Uh, I saw a few people on the avenue selling apples. And some people begged. They went from door to door asking for money. It was a very, very hard time. The economic situation was uh, very bad at that time. The banks closed and people couldn't get their money out. The Depression years of the 1930s confused American people. They'd always lived by the notion that they could achieve the American dream if they worked hard, if they saved, uh, if they followed the rules. But in the 1930s it wasn't possible. This is the story of the Great Depression, of the people who lived through it, of the president who struggled to end it, and of the legacies it handed down to all of us. President Calvin Coolidge had a simple philosophy about government. Do nothing. Or failing that, do very little. Four-fifths of all our troubles would disappear if we would sit down and keep still. Coolidge could afford to follow that advice. For in the 1920s, the United States enjoyed the greatest economic boom that the world had ever seen. In a single decade, industrial production almost doubled wages rose and work hours went down, so many Americans had more money and time to snap up new consumer products like automobiles and radios. The business of the American people is business. And the president made it his business to unleash the free market. With the help of his Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, Coolidge slashed corporate and personal taxes, allowing the rich to increase their share of national wealth. By 1929, 5% of American families controlled 30% of the nation's income. Because the prosperity is concentrated into a smaller number of people, it's harder and harder as the 20s go on for ordinary people to consume the enormous number of goods that the economy is producing. As inventories piled up and manufacturers cut back on production, Corporations and individual investors plowed their money into the stock market. The stock market is located mainly in New York City. It allows various Americans with money to buy bits and pieces of corporations. The corporations will sell stock in their own company. In the 1920s, there were not very many regulations that pertain to the owning and selling of stocks, at least far fewer than there are today. And one of the main things that happened was that people were allowed to buy stocks on what was called on the margin. That is, they didn't need a great deal of money to purchase uh, stock. If stock cost, uh, let's say, $100 uh, a share, people could, could take $10 to buy a share. This meant that people could buy enormous quantities of stock for very little money. They were eager to do so because stock prices were rising. A speculative fever seized investors as people traded stories of humble street peddlers who became overnight millionaires by playing the market. 
But the binge of speculation and buying on margin had inflated the price of stocks way beyond their real value. And by 1929, stockbrokers had lent out billions of dollars in loans to their customers, money they would never see again. The whole system began to collapse on October 29, 1929. When stock prices declined, brokers began to call in their loans. When the investors couldn't pay because they didn't have the money, the stockbrokers were forced to sell the stocks. Stocks dumped on the market drove prices further down. Within a few weeks, stocks lost half their value. General Electric plunged from $396 to $34 a share. U.S. Steel from $261 to $21. Businesses declared bankruptcy in droves. Unemployment soared. In Cleveland, Ohio, half the able-bodied men were unemployed. In Akron, 60%. In Toledo, 80%. Across America, millions of jobless men, or hobos, took to the roads. As incomes plunged, families were evicted from their homes. They shivered in tents and cooked over wood fires. During the Depression, there was very little money. And uh, as far as jobs were concerned, a lot of firms had permanent signs that said, no help wanted, I remember. Riding on the trolley car, there was this big, long line of men that must have been three blocks long, waiting for food. Even though I was quite young, it struck me as, as being sad, a very sad situation. Dear Mr. Hoover, could we not have employment and food to eat? Our children have schoolless days and shoeless days, while banks are bursting with money. Why are we reduced to poverty and starving and anxiety? Why not end the depression? Have you not a heart? I am an ignorant man, and you are supposed to have great brains. Americans had every reason to believe that the new president, Herbert Hoover, could pull them out of the depression. During World War I, Hoover headed the U.S. Food Administration, supervising the relief effort for war-torn Europe. And as Coolidge's Secretary of Commerce, he organized government assistance programs for business. When the Great Depression struck, Hoover tried the traditional remedies for ending recessions. He won a promise from business leaders to keep wages steady. He organized committees of volunteers to collect charity and encouraged local governments to provide more relief for the poor. Hoover was a very, very activist president for that time. He didn't help end the Depression to any extent, but he was trying. The main problem is twofold. One is that nobody knows how to cure the Depression. People are stumbling around trying to figure out how to get the economy to work. And two, Hoover himself, uh, in terms of public opinion, in terms of the, his use of the media, was an absolute disaster. Despite Hoover's cheerleading, the Depression worsened. Businesses continued to cut jobs and wages. Teetering on the verge of bankruptcy, local governments slashed their relief rolls. And Herbert Hoover, who had called for jokes to raise the nation's spirits, became the butt of one himself. He just doesn't get it. He just doesn't know how to convince the American people that he's on their side, that he's trying to solve their problems, uh, that he wants the Depression to end. On the contrary, he comes off as someone who doesn't care about them. Across the United States, makeshift communities of boxes and tin shacks became known as Hoovervilles. An empty pocket turned outwards was a Hoover flag. A newspaper covering a sleeping hobo was a Hoover blanket. But humor could not mask the deep reservoir of frustration that welled up across the country. Bitter strikes rocked the nation. When unarmed workers marched on Ford's River Rouge car plant, the company's police guards opened fire. 
Five days of fighting left four people dead and 50 injured. The outlook for the nation's farmers was just as gloomy. As prices plummeted, farmers could not make mortgage payments or even get their crops to market. So while people starved in the cities, farmers dumped milk on the highways in California and burned corn for warmth in Nebraska. Despite widespread misery, Hoover refused to back federal relief or public works for the poor and unemployed. The one thing he didn't want to do was to, to spend government money to actually help people. He, he believed really in a more trickle-down philosophy that you help the people at the top first and that will work. But nothing he tried really worked. Hoover did establish the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which lent federal money to struggling banks and railroads to stimulate the economy. Otherwise, President Hoover counted on the country to solve the Depression on its own. This is a day of national consecration. And I am certain that on this day my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. Our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This nation is asking for action and action now. The main difference between Hoover and Roosevelt is that Roosevelt has a terrific radio personality, a terrific way of getting himself across to the people. He acts in such a way that people believe that he's on their side, and that transforms their sense of what the Depression is about. Hoover never had a chance in 1932. His Democratic Party opponent, New York Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt, swept the presidential election, winning all but six states. Roosevelt immediately embarked on the famous 100 Days, a feverish flurry of legislation that formed the core of his first New Deal. Roosevelt had no great theory about how to get out of the Depression. He often likened himself to a football quarterback who tried one play, if it didn't work, he tried another play. Because the nation was scared to death and there was a cooperative Congress, almost everything that he suggested was passed quickly by, uh, uh, by Congress. The first problem the new president faced was a banking crisis. Bank reserves were so depleted that Americans used Canadian dollars in Michigan and Mexican pesos in California. Atlanta and Richmond printed their own currency. So in his first act as president, Roosevelt finished closing the nation's banks, most of which had already shut their doors, and pushed through laws to increase government control of the nation's financial system. When banks reopened after a four-day holiday, more people deposited money than withdrew it. Roosevelt was already well on his way to reviving Americans' flagging faith in themselves. But Roosevelt realized that the revival would require more than speeches and publicity. Economic recovery would take new federal laws and agencies. So Franklin Roosevelt coupled Hoover's techniques of morale building with an unprecedented buildup of the federal government. The first task was to repair the country's broken industries. In the three short years following the stock market crash, the nation's volume of production had been cut in half. Nearly 80% of its automobile factories and 90% of its steel mills stood idle. Roosevelt's answer was the National Industrial Recovery Act. The act allowed the federal government to negotiate agreements that regulated production, prices, and wages in each industry. Roosevelt's other great problem was the failing American farm. Farmers were producing so much that agricultural prices went into a tailspin. Making less money even while they produced more food 
farmers couldn't pay back their loans and were forced to abandon their land. Storms and droughts ravaged the Great Plains, transforming 15,000 square miles from the Oklahoma Panhandle to western Kansas into a gigantic dust bowl. Houses were buried, animals suffocated, and children lost their way home from school. Many days the air is just full of dirt coming for hundreds of miles. It sifts into everything. Dirt had blown into the house all week and lay inches deep. Last weekend, no one was taking an automobile out for fear of ruining the motor. The deaths of many babies and old people are attributed to breathing in so much dirt. Their farms ruined, hundreds of thousands of people packed up and headed to California and other points west. But life was difficult there too, not just for the newcomer Okies, but for Mexican Americans. After we lost our farm, we were forced to live on the road, traveling from farm to farm in search of work. The whole family would work for less than $10 a week. Roosevelt's solution to this farm crisis was another federal law and another federal bureaucracy. The Agricultural Adjustment Administration paid farmers to limit their production, which raised food prices. Millions of Americans could not wait for industry or agriculture to pick up. They were starving. They needed money in their pockets and food on their tables now. For the first time in United States history, Franklin Roosevelt established widespread federal relief. The Federal Emergency Relief Act provided cash, clothing, and food to Americans in need. Within 30 days, the Civil Works Administration put two and a half million people to work building roads, bridges, and schools. The Civilian Conservation Corps sent half a million young men to the countryside to clear hiking trails and drain swamps. Later, other alphabet soup agencies, like the Works Progress Administration, would employ millions more, doing everything from building courthouses to writing books. Roosevelt and his advisors favored these work projects over direct cash relief, even though they were far more expensive. Give a man a dole and you save his body and destroy his spirit. Give him a job and pay him an assured wage and you save both the body and the spirit. Harry Hopkins, Director, Works Projects Administration. Franklin Roosevelt recognized the power of radio, which let every citizen feel as if the president was talking personally to him or her. At a time of sharp social tensions and divisions, these fireside chats made Americans feel like they were part of a larger, more unified whole. With the cooperation of various city departments and under the sponsorship of the Crime Prevention Bureau of the Police Department, a number of city streets have been set aside for the use of the children of New York. Safe from the perils of crowded traffic thoroughfares, the youngsters are watchfully supervised by trained instructors removed from relief rolls. Every kind of game you Images of these provide. New Deal projects appeared in magazines and newsreels, allowing Americans to experience faraway tragedies and triumphs. Moviegoers in New York could feel the Kansas Dust Bowl as it swirled around on the screen before them. They could watch workers in Oregon busily building a huge new dam. And they could visit a Civilian Conservation Corps camp in Vermont, if only for a few flickering frames. When Americans turned on their radios, they heard not only the president, but also his wife. Host of a twice-weekly radio program, Eleanor Roosevelt became known as a tireless advocate of the poor and downtrodden. Within the White House, Eleanor Roosevelt served as a bridge between her husband and female activists who sought equal wages and work rules for women. She also helped African Americans gain access to her husband.
thanks in large part to Eleanor's influence, a so-called black cabinet advised the president for the first time in United States history. African Americans continued to face massive hardships on many fronts. The National Recovery Administration's Blue Eagle Codes allowed employers to fire blacks and replace them with white workers. Bitter African Americans joked that the NRA was the Negro Removal Act, and the New Deal's poor relief often failed to reach African Americans. Dear Mr. President, would you please direct the people in charge of the relief work to issue the provisions to our suffering colored people? I'm sorry to worry you with this, Mr. President, but the relief officials here give us black folks nothing but a few cans of pickled meat. And to white folks, they give blankets, boats of cloth, and things like that. Yours truly. I can't sign my name, Mr. President. They will beat me up and run me away from here. And this is my home. Franklin Roosevelt never supported African Americans as strongly as Eleanor did. Over the protests of his black cabinet and his own wife, the President of the United States refused to support a federal law to fight lynching. Since Southerners occupied strategic places on most of the Senate and House committees, Roosevelt believed that introducing an anti-lynching bill would cause the Southerners to block every bill he had asked Congress to pass. He would not take the risk. For Franklin Roosevelt's first New Deal, Black Monday came on May 27, 1935. On that morning, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the National Industrial Recovery Act was unconstitutional in two ways. The most important of which was that the act violated the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which allows Congress to regulate commerce between states, but not within them. Which other new legislation might the court strike down? The New Deal was also under fire from wealthy and conservative Americans. The American Liberty League, a coalition of rich businessmen, lobbied against what they regarded as the New Deal's reckless spending and socialist reforms. But Franklin Roosevelt was hardly a socialist. Rather than overthrowing the American free market system, he worked to save it. To preserve, Roosevelt said, we had to reform. Meanwhile, far from Washington, the New Deal faced a more radical grassroots challenge. In small towns and large cities, more and more Americans blamed big business for the Great Depression. And they thought Roosevelt's New Deal was just a prop for an economy that favored the rich. According to Huey Long, Louisiana's governor and later its senator, Americans needed money, not government. Long proposed to give it to them by taxing the rich. If Congress taxed millionaires at high enough rates, Long said, every family in the United States could receive $5,000, enough to buy a house, car, and radio. Under this plan, said the man they called Kingfish, every man would be a king. How many of you remember the first thing that the Declaration of Independence said? All men are created equal. Now, what did they mean by that? Did they mean that any one man was born to inherit ten billion dollars, and that another child was born to inherit nothing? Governor Huey Long, Louisiana. By 1934, Long and his Share the Wealth movement had over four million followers. They hated big government as much as they hated big business. Meanwhile, Father Coughlin, a Roman Catholic priest in Detroit, built a huge national radio audience by attacking Franklin Double Dealing Roosevelt for aiding Wall Street bankers. Coughlin boasted 40 million listeners and received even more mail than the president. Other New Deal critics embraced socialist or even communist solutions. In California, novelist Upton Sinclair ran for governor on a platform that called for workers, not bosses, to own and operate their factories. 
Communism was making inroads in the United States. The Great Depression convinced many people that capitalism did not work. Communism appeared to offer a solution. The Communist Party's support of workers and equal rights for African Americans made it seem like a modern and progressive movement in line with traditional American values. The Communist Party attracted a wide variety of Americans, ranging from high school and college students to southern sharecroppers, from steel workers and electricians to social reformers and intellectuals. Why, the Communists asked, should businesses be privately owned? If workers owned industry, they said, it would serve the great whole rather than the greedy few. An assassin's bullet brought Huey Long's career to a sudden halt in 1935. Even before that, Franklin Roosevelt was moving to head off the grassroots challenges to his new deal. He weighed in with a hefty new round of legislation, a second new deal. High atop the agenda stood his Emergency Relief Appropriation Act to get people back to work. To calm the fears of senior citizens, Roosevelt introduced the Social Security Act, creating the nation's first federal old age insurance system. This Social Security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. Social Security provided a measure of security for some 30 million Americans, but it did not cover many of the most needy, for among those excluded were domestic workers and farm workers, day laborers, and almost everyone who was underemployed. A second legislative initiative was the Revenue Act, or Wealth Tax Act, which was designed to increase taxes on the rich. And in an appeal to workers, Roosevelt supported the Wagner Labor Relations Act, which required companies to bargain with any union that its workers chose. No longer could a company fire an employee just for joining a union. For the first time, the federal government would protect the rights of workers. After passage of the Wagner Act, more than a million American workers joined labor unions. Using the new tactic of sit-down strikes, they won recognition from General Motors and other industrial giants. The fight to unionize industries was long and bloody. But by the end of the 1930s, the country's unions were stronger than ever before. Union members also voted for Franklin Roosevelt. With overwhelming labor support, Roosevelt was re-elected in a landslide in 1936. After Roosevelt's re-election, only the Supreme Court remained a thorn in Roosevelt's side. Earlier in 1936, it wiped out another jewel of the first New Deal, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Now it threatened to strike down the second New Deal, too, especially the Social Security Act and the Wagner Act. So Franklin Roosevelt decided to strike first. Roosevelt proposed a new federal law that would allow him to select up to six judges, increasing the size of the Supreme Court to 15. That way he could ensure that a majority of justices would uphold his new deal. But the plan backfired. Americans condemned the idea of overturning a constitutional tradition like the nine-man court. Critics compared Roosevelt to Hitler and Mussolini, who were busily destroying their own national constitutions. Just as the court-packing controversy reached a crescendo, the United States plunged back into a deep recession. Between Labor Day and New Year's, two million Americans lost their jobs. By the following March, the number would top four million. Industrial production plummeted faster than at any time in our history, the Great Crash included. What had gone wrong? Just before this new crash, Roosevelt had decided the economy was healthy enough that he could start to balance the federal budget. 
But with the new crisis, he shifted course again. Abandoning a balanced budget, Roosevelt decided to prime the pump, as he called it, by stimulating the sluggish economy with a quick injection of federal cash into public works projects. Deficit spending, that is, the government spending more money than it took in, helped snap the recession in 1938. That same year, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which created a national minimum wage. During World War II, federal spending skyrocketed from $9 billion to $100 billion. The war put the United States economy back on its feet. So deficit spending became one of the major legacies of the New Deal. The Second World War would solidify many of the political reforms of the Great Depression and a vast expansion in the size and the role of the federal government. Before 1932, the federal government had little impact on the lives of ordinary Americans. After the New Deal, it affected people's lives in a wide variety of ways. The New Deal laid the foundation for the country's welfare state, as the federal government took responsibility for the basic welfare of its people and dramatically increased spending to help the poor. More than a third of the population received direct assistance from new federal programs like Social Security. Social Security was a wonderful thing at the time. It really saved people's lives, literally, because there were a lot of suicides during that period. It was a very sad time. The New Deal also established the principle of federal responsibility for the health of the economy. Greater federal regulation and deficit spending to stimulate the economy were other major legacies of the New Deal. Well, I, I think particularly during the Depression, when people were doing without, literally doing without, uh, <coughs> we were closer to our neighbors. We were caring about our neighbors' situation much more so than today. Instead of trying to keep up with the Joneses, we were trying to help the Joneses. All in all, I think it brought people closer together. While economic crises in Europe gave rise to dictators like Adolf Hitler in Germany and Benito Mussolini in Italy, in the United States, the Great Depression strengthened democracy and drew more people into political action. In World War II, democracy and fascism would clash in a deadly struggle that would engulf the world. <laughs> 